Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Turner, and I direct the China Environment Forum at the Wilson Center. I'd like to welcome you to our meeting today, which is also co-sponsored by the Kissinger Institute at the Wilson Center. Um, so, you know, the title, which I assume you know since you've tuned in today, is uh, called China's Coercive Environmentalism. Uh, over the past couple of years, uh, Xi Jinping has come out talking often about how China is becoming the world's leader on climate, the green leader, and we've seen you know, within China, a lot of investments in clean energy, renew, you know, renewables, they lead in wind. There's, there's a lot of, you know, buttons that are being pushed that saying that, you know, yes, China is looking green. And, but we're, we're in a world right now where there's accelerating environmental health threats from climate change, biodiversity loss, plastic pollution. And, you know, the world is facing huge challenges, demanding global action. And China is increasingly a huge player in this, both in terms of, you know, potentially helping to address it or, exacerbating these problems. Now, with these kind of challenges in mind, we've got uh, two professors here, Judy Shapiro and Ite Lee, who they wrote a book. <laughs> Happened to be called China Goes Green, China, a Coercive Environmentalism for a, a Troubled Planet. Um, and they're gonna, they're, I, I created this meeting. I mean, this, this book came out. It was kind of a good time to talk about this topic anyway, because I mean, you know, we've seen a lot of movement, even recently, um, well, Xi Jinping saying that China is gonna go carbon neutral. And it seemed like a really opportune moment to, to bring this conversation together. Um, so we're gonna start out with, with Judy Shapiro, uh, who is a uni uh, American University School of International Service, um, well known for her work on global environmentalism, particularly focused in Asia and China, Mao's War Against China, the first book that, that a lot of people read when they go into this field. Um, and now coming up to this current book, which she co-wrote with uh, Ife Li, who's NYU Shanghai, Sorry, late at night there for you, Ife. Um, he is a global network assistant professor and a lot of his work is looking kind of more at the macro impact of China's environmental government governance, looking at state society issues and also global impact. So they're gonna start, they're gonna kick us off at the beginning talking about kind of like the, the force and the flaws of China's environmentalism. And then uh, after they speak with a couple of questions, Jingjing Zhang is going to step in, she is, she works at the Center for Transnational Environmental Accountability at University of Maryland uh, School of Law. She is an environmental lawyer that if you Google Chinese environmental lawyer, she might come up first. Uh, I met her, Jingjing, I met you back when you were at the Center for Legal Assistance for Pollution Victims, bringing up a lot of groundbreaking cases on pollution. Uh, she's had a big influence on public interest law in China when she worked at Natural Resources Defense Council, PIL, PIL Network. Uh, and so when she talks today, she's with her under her new job at uh, University of Maryland, she's, she's tromping on the Belt and Road, shining a light on issues of environmental, not good governance. And uh, we're gonna have her talk on that. So you all don't wanna hear me talk. You wanna hear these great, cool professors talk. These are not ivory tower types. These are, there's a very applied real world kind of uh, discussions we're gonna have today. So, um, Judy, Ife, I'd like you to, to kick off the conversation, kind of, I guess, doing a ping pong presentation, no PowerPoint, awesome. Um, and to give us kind of a context for this uh, environmental authoritarianism argument and, you know, and, and tell us too, like, why did you write this book? I will mute myself and the floor is yours. All right, why don't I go first? Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Jennifer um, for providing such an important home for so many of us who work on China and the environment. Um, I really think that the contribution Jennifer has made over these years is very significant indeed. And um, it's a real pleasure for me and for Ife to be able to present our most recent book here, um, China Goes Green, Coercive Environmentalism for a Troubled Planet. Um, I'd like to start by talking a little bit about one of the impetuses for the book. Uh, I think there are two main impetuses. Uh, and I'll start first to talk about this concept of ecological migration, which I began to hear about a few decades ago. And it sounds like it's something really great. Like maybe it's, I don't know, people who live in flood zones and coastal areas deciding not to build back after hurricanes because they acknowledge, you know, climate change. Well, it turns out that ecological migration in China um, has the meaning of uh, essentially forcibly relocating nomadic people into settlements and achieving the state's goals of pacifying the borders, which they've been trying to do for literally centuries um, 
but it has been very damaging for uh, nomadic peoples in the West. And so I think as somebody who works on the environment, you know, I've worked on human rights issues, freedom of association issues, public information issues, all these issues for years and years. But as somebody who has come to work on the environment somewhat more recently, I found myself particularly um, appalled by the use of this environmental cloak to justify what are essentially repressive measures. So I've been thinking about that for a long, long time. And Ife and I met at a number of conferences where we were on the same panel and we got to know each other when we were um, both teaching in China. And we realized, you know what, there might be a book here. Um, so Ife, uh, there's another main impetus and I'm gonna turn it over to Ife to talk about that other main impetus. And I think then you'll see the synergy in our thinking. All right, thanks, Judy, and, and thank you, Jennifer, so much for providing this opportunity for us to talk about the book, and thank you, Jing Jing, also for joining the panel. I admire your work. It's just so great to be on the same panel with you, Jing Jing. Um, now, as Judy alluded to, there is a second impetus for us to work together to write this book, which is really our observations about how environmental scholars and activists and observers in the West um, all have been rightfully frustrated by democracies. And there's uh, a tremendous amount of um, frustration with regard, with regard to how uh, democracies have not been able to produce effective, consistent, robust responses to climate change in particular and environmental challenges in general. And in light of that frustration, some um, scholars and observers and increasingly many more um, people are uh, speculating uh, that authoritarianism may be the way to go, that may be the way to go. They seem to be flirting with the idea that if authoritarianism uh, has a track record of success in China, uh, for example, the plastic bag ban, the renewable energy promotion policies and so on and so forth, uh, maybe that approach can be generalized to the whole world. Whenever we see discussions like that, we oftentimes would like to pause for a bit and think, well, uh, what really does authoritarian environmentalism look like? Um, these, these bright side stories notwithstanding, there are also consequences uh, with regard to using draconian authoritarian measures um, to accomplish environmental ends. So in this book, what we try to do is to take systematic stock of various kinds of environmental, environmental interventions by the Chinese state domestically as well as internationally to try to systematically evaluate the evidence that we have about using authoritarian means to accomplish environmental ends in China and outside of China by the Chinese state. Um, so, so the goal really is to provide an evidence-based account so that whenever we talk about authoritarian environmentalism, we're not talking um, about merely speculative ideas, but concrete evidence about how to achieve these things. So I think now I'll give you a really fast overview of the structure of the book. Um, and then maybe Ife can talk about some of our theoretical uh, findings. Um, what we did was we organized the book in four parts, starting in the developed East, moving to the less developed West, moving out onto the Belt and Road, and then discovering really that China is manipulating even the global commons. Um, so for each of those areas, we identified tools that the state tends to like to use. So um, I won't give you all of them, but uh, for example, campaigns and crackdowns or target setting, behavior modification, what we're calling one size fits all policy making, green grabbing, uh, ecological migration, which I already mentioned, win-win green developmental, developmentalism um, and the export of green technocracy. And uh, finally, um, outer space environmentalism. So that's the basic structure of the book. And um, what we find over and over again is that in the wielding of these tools, uh, often that state-led top-down kind of goal setting ends up sweeping vulnerable people into the net. Often people suffer, um, not everybody suffers, some, but sometimes in the name of achieving that goal, innocent people suffer. One of my favorite examples, if I can, in Hunan, uh, there was a goal to achieve a certain 
air pollution clarity over the course of last summer. And it was discovered that during the threshing season, pollution levels spiked. So the local officials who are always looking upwards to see whether they're going to get promoted, um, banned the use of threshing machines. And of course, all the, the crops rotted. That's a classic sort of um, example. Um, so anyway, we discovered that these targets and goals and campaigns tend to work only if civil society can be involved, only if uh, ordinary people are um, supportive of these measures. So when you spring something on, say, the people of Shanghai, like a garbage sorting um, regulation where they have, can only come within two hours of the day and they have their social credit uh, impacted if they don't recycle properly, you know, that has a very negative impact. And then sometimes people end up just trying to throw their stuff by the side of the road or bring it into work. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the structure of the book. And um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ife. All right, uh, I just wanna to add to what Judy already said by um, pointing out that in this book, we have both negative and uh, positive cases, if you will, uh, as a general um, generalization. Uh, it's important to recognize what are some of the factors that let certain environmental interventions to work in particular ways and, and the factors that resulted in failures. One of the things that we wanted to highlight, especially towards the conclusion chapter of the book, is that um, state intervention or state-led environmentalism in China has the tendency to succeed whenever the state remains open to inputs from various groups outside of the state. And by that, we mean journalists, independent scientists, students, um, civil society groups, advocacy groups, and even international actors, filmmakers, and what have you. Whenever the state remains open to these various actors uh, in, in, in the environmental world, they become sensitized to the various interests and groups and livelihoods considerations of these groups that may or may, or may not be immediately apparent to the Chinese state. And we've also documented cases in which the Chinese state acted decisively, but without listening to these various groups um, and their interventions in the end resulted in environmental harm even in some of the cases because they uh, nobody could foresee the full extent of ecosystem responses to human interventions. And when they didn't listen to scientists, whether it's in the case of a dam project or the making of monocultural forests in some of the high profile Chinese afforestation campaigns in the Northern part of the country, if they didn't listen to uh, scientists who knew forestry science way better than state actors, then these projects ended up uh, going awry, producing more environmental harm than good. Um, so, so I think once again, to take stock of the various positive and negative cases, we just wanted to highlight how important it is for, for Chinese state power to be placed in check by civil society groups, scientists, journalists, and all of these other actors. Another theme that we noticed was a very technocratic um, approach to uh, solving China's environmental challenges. So one case that we profiled, um, I didn't know about it before we began the book, is the effort to manipulate the weather on the Tibetan plateau. Uh, you know, we know about shooting uh, silver iodide into the air to create rain to get a blue skies Olympics or a, an apex blue kind of Beijing. But this is a much more systematic effort. They have something like 500 of these machines already active on the Tibetan plateau. Um, and they're planning tens of thousands more with the idea that they'll use um, satellites to know when the monsoons are coming up from India, shoot all that, those pellets into the sky, have it rain so as to basically counterbalance the um, melting of the glaciers, which is um, having such an impact in the long run on the aquifers in North China. Um, so this is a kind of a scary idea, weather modification, um, geoengineering in general, very untested sort of a thing. Uh, but I think uh, the notion that somehow environmental issues are basically technical issues that are amenable to being fixed by um, the state uh, is a kind of a scary issue. And it's um, 
something for us to consider as we think about China going out. And I know that that's going to be a theme when we bring Jingjing into the conversation. Some of these tools and techniques are actually, they're being framed as a win-win green developmentalism. You know, the whole planet is going to benefit from this. But a lot of these sort of social controls um, and technocratic attitudes are also being exported. So our finding is that on the Belt and Road, for example, even though China is being heavily criticized for exporting coal-fired power plants, in general, the attitude is that it's going to be green because of the carbon um, evaluation with no understanding at all of the impact of these uh, infrastructure projects on biodiversity, for example, when you build big dams, when you set um, high speed railroads through endangered ecosystems, when you build super highways, when you dig deep water ports. So all of these elements of the Belt and Road Initiative have enormous impacts on biodiversity. And yet the, the state doesn't even, it's like they'd never heard about that. So these things are very concerning. So are you, is your ping pong match done? <laughs> Actually, my screen, you're on either side, which makes it even more adorable. Before I forget, some people have already started doing it, but low tech here. If you want to ask questions, it's it's written on the webinar, but you go to at Wilson CEF and also Claire Aldbrokish at wilsoncenter.org, note, period, and, and hyphen. Um, so you can see those. Just start submitting questions whenever a few have started coming in. Um, so I, th I think that... Um, before we go on to um, Jingjing though, I think we, I wanted to have you guys just do a quick kind of a round robin to kind of get us thinking a little bit more about the BRI. Um, I mean, Judy, you started a little bit here, but can you give us kind of, just tell us anything else about, you know, the BRI that kind of helps contextualize a little bit even more, maybe an example um, of, of that relates to your book. An example that relates to the book on the Brie. Well, just this, tell us about this, Brie. this win win green developmentalism, um, we had a lot of fun. I have had a lot of fun um, um, sort of parsing the propaganda around the Brie. Um, there's some hilarious videos that the state has put out, but basically, one that we spent a page or two on um, has Xi Jinping you know, waking up <laughs> in Xi'an, dreaming of camels, because he was from Xi'an, right? Um, and thinking about this co-prosperity and um, just the way the whole thing is packaged is all about, you know, young people of multiple ethnicities and multiple cultural stereotypes all marching towards a glorious future where everything's going to be fabulous. And yet we know um, very well that all, I think your audience already knows this, we don't have to go over it again, the accusations of um, debt trap diplomacy and the fact that many of these projects are actually facilitating the extraction of resources that China is very inexperienced in consulting with indigenous people, um, with community um, consultations, the environmental impact assessments tend to be flawed. And many of the recipient countries, rather than being just overjoyed and dancing towards a glorious future of the Belt and Road, are saying, whoa, 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 let's rethink this. Let's um, maybe even um, renegotiate the deal or maybe back off or, ca or cancel them completely. Well, China does say that they, you know, that they, and, and, I, and you did note this before that, you know, that China follows the, the host country's environmental laws and regulations. And, uh, and I think this is something I think that maybe Ife might go into a little bit, but that there's a real missed opportunity because China has, you know, there are good news stories within China. I mean, you know, they wrestle with some, but you know, even environmental impact assessments, they have a system. It doesn't always work that well, but they, they have off-grid renewables. There's a lot of the clean and green technologies and, and policies that, that could also become part of the Belt and Road. I don't know, Ife, did you, did you wanna dive into a little bit about on the, the technology, the green tech angle here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the stuff that we see about, about the Belt and Road Initiative is discursive in quality. We've heard a lot that about green development, a lot about low carbon development, uh, a lot about wing-wing developmentalism, which is in fact the section uh, in the book which, which we uh, expanded upon um, 
right there. Um, but in general, um, I think what we tried to do in the book is to problematize these, these claims of win-win development and green development by looking at actual projects and their environmental impacts. It seems just very clear that a lot of the projects may have uh, some carbon credit merits, you know, they may end up uh, reducing the amount of carbon emissions in the host country in some cases. But in general, I think the loss of uh, biodiversity is just so too significant to be overlooked. Um, and we're not talking about a general loss of biodiversity, but uh, some of the most ecologically sensitive areas in the host countries that are being affected, areas that historically have not seen a tremendous amount of development, but now because of the hot cash coming from the Chinese state, they're now being subject to an unprecedented level of development and growth. Um, so, so that environmental aspect of the project is definitely something that needed to be accounted for. And a lot of people have already pointed out these issues. But perhaps more problematically, on the note of, of green technocracy um, that uh, Jennifer and Judy, you both pointed out, um, we wanted to highlight how the export of green technologies may have some solar panel components, may have some wind turbine components, but a lot of it is also surveillance technology that China is exporting to its Belt and Road uh, partner countries. Um, when, whenever uh, there's, a, there's a, a package deal, which is oftentimes negotiated bilaterally between China and its partner country, um, these deals often include the export of various tools that have a, have a proven track record of success in China in monitoring citizen behaviors. There seems to be the argument that if the same model, uh, which works quote unquote well in China, can be exported to these other countries on the Belt and Road to monitor their citizen behaviors. That's a way for China to export its entire governance model. But also we're in, in, uh, in the book, we talk about the establishment of a uh, China-owned satellite networks to monitor um, development in these uh, Belt and Road countries using remote sensing data that is basically Chinese state's proprietary data. Um, that China argues that gives its um, partner countries on the Belt and Road unprecedented access to remote sensing data, which is true. Um, but at the same time, that data is owned by the Chinese state. Uh, the, the Chinese state essentially gets to decide how much to share and what to share, um, and, and, or for that matter, when they want to stop sharing. Um, so, so I think you know the, the, the technological aspect of the project has several different dimensions to it. And we would do well to actually uh, fully account for the consequences of embracing that model of uh, technocratic governance. And actually, along kind of writing on the back of that, there, a question did come in from Harley Balzer at Georgetown University um, that about how much do we know about China kind of shutting down polluting industries within China and sending them down the road? I mean, you know, early on, I remember there were these kind of anecdotes. Uh, that it was kind of like, you know, it, it, it gave new life to companies that they weren't allowing within China. Um, someone want to respond to that, that question from Harley? You know, particularly in, he asked about Cambodia, Burma, Russia, and others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, in general, there is, um, especially with respect to coal-fired power plants, there's a, an argument that um, there's overcapacity now in China because so many of these have been shut down. And so all the expertise and the heavy machinery and all that is, is going out. And I had a student when I was in China, actually from Jamaica, and she said China is building coal-fired power plants in Jamaica. So um, the problem with calculating anybody, this will get to this question later on, I guess, about the carbon neutrality, calculating any country's environmental footprint or carbon footprint, if you restrict it to your own borders, you're not really measuring the sort of the, what they call the shadow ecology of the mm -hmm. thing. So if China is at the same time increasing the carbon output of some of these recipient countries, then sorry, it's, it's not a great, uh, great deal. I want to add just one thing. It's a sort of Ife's brilliant uh, formulation as we approach the end of the book and we were writing our conclusion. And we talk about, um, you know, people are talking about using um, authoritarian means in order to achieve environmental goals. But in fact, what we found was that China is much more using environmental means to further authoritarian goals in case after case after case. 
So, you know, whether it's environmental authoritarianism or authoritarian environmentalism, I think that that's, um, you know, probably one of the biggest um, insights that we came up with. Um, yeah, I, I also want to add to that just real quick by pointing out that uh, we've we've done several other events in which speakers, uh, in which uh, members of the audience ask us, uh, how can the Chinese state still be authoritarian outside of China? Um, I think that's a terrific question. What we're documenting in the book is that domestically, we're seeing an escalated intervention using coercive means into citizen lives, uh, into businesses, into um, civil society at large, but internationally, China is trying to enhance its geopolitical leverage and uh, to improve its own presence, to improve its own image outside of China by engaging itself in projects that are ostensibly environmental. But at their cores, we're finding a lot of geopolitical leverages um, that are uh, primarily at play. So once again, uh, I think the overall pattern is that uh, environmentalism or environmental protection is being used as a pretext for a lot of domestic and international um, interests that may or may not be explicitly stated in many of the projects we're documenting. And just one quick add to that, it's all under that umbrella of ecological civilization, right? So this is China led, you know, it's not Western, you know, go for it, it's green, and it, it's all about the greatness of China and everything fits under it. And so come join the party, because if you don't, you're gonna be left out in the cold. So really okay. quite fascinating. <laughs> well, the ping pong match intensified here at the end. Well, I'm gonna have them put a pause on their, you know, we know how Chinese play ping pong. Um, so let's, I'd like to kind of maybe shift over to, to Jing Jing here um, to talk, talk to us a little bit about, you know, the work that you've been doing and the insights you've seen, um, you know, cause you've been on the ground. Um, and I think you're gonna give us some stories about Zimbabwe and here she is. I will just mute myself and Jing Jing, tell us your stories about your, the promises, reality and actions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. I think I, I can this is my sixth time as a speaker in the China Environment Forum and uh, uh, in the past uh, 15 years. And uh, I really appreciate uh, Jennifer host this forum and provides a platform for all of us uh, scholars, practitioners like me. Um, I, I'm a practitioner, I'm not a scholar like uh, Professor uh, Judy Shapiro and uh, Yifei. Um, uh, and, but uh, now I'm in this sitting in the uh, at law school and uh, uh, bring the younger generation of uh, environment lawyers to the um, ground and uh, ident identify issues um, we, we hope to serve the community. So uh, Kate, uh, the Judy and Ife, your book, uh, China Goes Green, like a uh, uh, big, um, huge promise China uh, Chinese leadership uh, has made to the world, and so I today my talk I just start from the promise and reality and action and what meant uh, what the green belt road um, uh, means. Um, so I hope uh, yeah, some of you can summarize. I think our audience, most of our audience, know what uh, BRI. Uh, is and um, uh, but uh, I still want to discuss. Or th this is my question to you. Uh, Belt Road Initiative is a foreign policy. Uh, is uh, China's uh, in, uh, international development plan or the geopolitic uh, strategic uh, um, plan? So that is uh, uh, my question. It's hard to use one sentence to. Um, uh, summarize uh, Belt Road Initiative, but uh, we we do know the Belt Road Initiative has a significant uh, uh, impact on the environment, the biodiversity globally. So here's I, I want to uh, actually use my uh, work and the cases to uh, indicate, uh, reflect on the two professors' uh, uh, points uh, view on they just uh, mentioned. 
Um, so we heard a lot about uh, green belt road, green and clean belt road. And uh, when we talk about green, everyone may um, assume you know what uh, green uh, uh, means and what clean means. Uh, clean, I think there are two meanings, clean uh, technology, clean uh, low carbon technology. And another clean is, means there's uh, um, China wants uh, belt road initiative. Um, um, there's no uh, bribery corruption alongside the Bell Roads um, initiative is another, another claim. And I would show this uh, picture um, to the audience and uh, uh, some of you may uh, know uh, what uh, it is and some may not. And so I'll just show, this is a logo um, for the, um, COP15, the party's uh, conference of the uh, very important uh, international environment uh, um, treaty, which is a uh, 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 convention of uh, biological diversity. So it's CPT in short. Um, this year is a significant, important year for uh, biodiversity. And we just had uh, the, the UN uh, summit on the biodiversity and the uh, COP15 is a, a party uh, um, uh, conference, uh, which is supposed to uh, held next uh, month in Kunming and now uh, postponed to ne uh, next year, uh, still in Kunming. So it's also a very significant event for China. And so you look at this logo, you, you can uh, yeah, imagine why, uh, where it comes from. Um, you see it, panda, you see, uh, animals, you saw this uh, little girl. Um, and then down to the uh, end of this uh, picture, you see this uh, expression, ecologic civilization, building a shared future for all lives on earth. This is the theme, official theme uh, for the COP15 of the uh, Convention of the Biologic Diversity. So it's, uh, um, official thing. And so for those um, who knows China's politics, uh, you can find that main theme uh, actually incorporated to two um, major um, um, ideology, uh, the theme or concept uh, of China, ecologic civilization and a shared future for all life. And so there's uh, the two uh, political slogan alongside with Belt Road Initiative have been used for some years. China has been uh, tried very hard to promote these two concepts uh, uh, at UN and every international um, um, settings. And uh, uh, now it's uh, became the theme of this important uh, international event for the biodiversity. I, I consider it a, a significant promise uh, made uh, by China. And so they're one of the, they're, this is a very latest um, um, promise China made to the world. And uh, then and that, uh, another one you already mentioned, uh, the Xi Jinping made uh, 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 promise uh, the pledge uh, China, uh, the CO2 emission will peak uh, before 2030 and China will strive to achieve carbon neutrality before 2060, uh, which uh, sounds uh, very significant good. And uh, uh, if China can make a, keep the promise, and that will be uh, great for our planet. Uh, but my question is still from the promise to um, action and to result, there's long, very, very long way to go. And there are many other promises uh, alongside with the Belt Road Initiative, uh, um, such as the green investment principle for the Belt Road Initiative, and the, which many Chinese uh, banks have signed, uh, initiated and signed in 2019 last year. And the Chinese government uh, uh, announced the guidance on promoting green Belt Road Initiative in 2017. And China's uh, Minister of the Foreign Affairs, Wang Yi, uh, made this statement, joint response to climate change for a better environment for our planet uh, last year and UN. 
and early, uh, much earlier than eight years ago, China, uh, Chinese government are uh, the uh, the uh, in, uh, the back uh, regulatory uh, commission announced the green creative guidance. So you can see this uh, keywords uh, green and um, almost in all those uh, promise and uh, um, uh, that is the, those are promises. And uh, um, I let let me show if uh, China. Uh, has been keeping those permits too, and uh, how long we can um, reach the goal and you know, uh, make those uh, promises too. So the reality is uh, what I found, uh, I said, uh, we still have a long way to go to see the result uh, which those uh, promise has uh, met. Um, most outbound in, uh, investment along the Belt Road Initiative have high environment and social risk, as Yifei already mentioned, and uh, uh, our national legislation uh, doesn't uh, reflect uh, uh, those promise. Uh, um, some of them uh, uh, did, um, but uh, some uh, those are at least here uh, uh, didn't reflect those uh, uh, absorbed those uh, promise into China's. Uh, um, uh, why exactly I can say the environment impact assessment can only apply to the project within China, and for all those outbound investment project, there is no requirement, no legal requirement for those uh, project owner, the companies, to conduct environment impact assessment uh, before the government uh, give approval, before the company reaches the uh, project and uh, Minister of Commerce and, and our, uh, NDRC. And so there's no environment impact assessment on the outbound investment decision. And uh, if you look at the very recent legislation, energy law and the coal industry law, um, both of them were announced, the draft was announced this year and uh, the, uh, the government, the, uh, the government is, uh, department in charge of uh, drafting this two uh, legislation uh, call on public comments. And if you read the, those two drafts and uh, you didn't see uh, the draft, the two drafts reflect uh, uh, the Chinese government's uh, promise to make uh, uh, carbon neutral and uh, make the uh, green, as a green leader uh, in the world. And the coal industry law, especially, if you look at it, it's, I call it uh, promoting, promotion coal, coal industry law. And there's no any article on climate change, and there's just one or two uh, article mentioned the environment protection. And for the China as uh, prom give such a huge promise to the world and reach uh, carbon neutral um, in by 2016, and the law didn't reflect that. So that is uh, one uh, national uh, law didn't reflect those promise and. Uh, Chinese company lack of the awareness of the sustainable development and the lack of the environment and human rights due diligence uh, policies and practice that is I have found in a Belt Road uh, host uh, investment host country. So there's some uh, example and uh, I'm not the messenger to bring the good news. Every time uh, the news I showed here, the story I showed here, they must have some uh, dark sides. Uh, and so you see this uh, uh, Samando um, project in Guinea. Samando is a forest, the name of uh, a place, uh, we call Samando Forest or the uh, mountain. And uh, it's in Guinea. Guinea is a small country in West Africa, but it has a, uh, the world's biggest uh, uh, bauxite reserve. But here, Samando is not bauxite, it's iron. And uh, Samando, the iron, is considered uh, the, uh, the first tier of the undevelopment, the undeveloped um, iron in the world, the biggest in the, uh, the iron, undeveloped uh, iron in the world. And uh, the Chinese uh, capital 
um, is flowing to this place uh, because the two Chinese companies have got the mining rights in this place. And uh, what significance of the biodiversity and the, the uh, climb of this uh, the mining? Uh, this place is called the water power of the West Africa. And uh, it's uh, the source of the um, rivers and, and flow to the other uh, West, uh, the West African countries, Liberia and Guinea itself, Ghana. And so it uh, um, has a very significant role in the local um, ecosystem. And here, uh, this is uh, what uh, the Guinea government said, uh, Mando, it's a world-class project to support economic trans uh, transformation of the Guinea. So they are, uh, the government expecting uh, China and other international investors bring on um, the capital and stimulate uh, the economic development in, uh, in Guinea and uh, China. One of this uh, um, uh, mining company, SMB, which uh, formed by a uh, Chinese company, uh, Singapore com company, and uh, is planning to invest uh, 14 billion uh, investment to this, uh, the two block, this uh, cemento iron. And they will build the 600 kilometer long railway and uh, uh, the port, and, uh, and they, they will have uh, open pit and, and mining, iron mining on the top of the cemento. And the Mando is also the home of the West Africa chimpanzee, and uh, it's an endangered, uh, one of the endangered species. And uh, so you see this uh, mining um, will bring economic opportunity to the country. Of course, it will damage the home of this endangered species and will damage the ecosystem, which provides the water resource for um, the nearby uh, countries. This is one uh, story, Samando, and uh, you see I show the mining, how the mining will affect the nearby environment. And uh, the picture is not from Samando, it's from other place, but uh, it, it illustrates how it will impact the local ecosystem, especially this um, mine is on the top of the mountain, it's open pit. And then we move to another uh, country, nearby country, and uh, same uh, um, place, uh, I mean, similar uh, biodiversity, um, significant uh, um, uh, hot uh, uh, spots uh, in Ghana and China uh, signed um, uh, infrastructure for natural resource deal with Ghana and Ghana agreed to uh, pay back uh, uh, China's um, the infrastructure project by giving the um, bauxite ore and alumni. Mm -hmm. And that uh, deal uh, will affect this uh, first, uh, Ativa range first, and uh, um, I'm sure it's a home for this tiny, creature, the, the frog and endangered uh, species. Should we protect this tiny species and uh, or should we uh, have this economic development opportunity? That is decision the host country has to make. And but the, the, the capital, the, the flow and the, uh, the investment is so promising and uh, Ghana do, does need the development and they don't need the infrastructure, they need the highway, they need the railway. And so they yeah, signed this agreement and then um, the frog may lose its home and maybe it's, it doesn't matter for, uh, for the country, but it does matter for our ecosystem. And so our uh, local uh, NGO, the, uh, has filed this mitigation, try to stop this project and the case is ongoing. And they said that the high court accepted the uh, NGO's uh, legal claim and um, uh, hopefully uh, we can stop um, all together. Um, we can uh, challenge and stop this project uh, which will challenge this tiny species here. And the last one we uh, talk, uh, we, now we jump to another part of the Africa. And th this picture looks uh, good. And because I haven't shown the real uh, the impact of this uh, project, um, 
six-month uh, coal power uh, station uh, and now is promised to uh, contract by the uh, Gozoba um, uh, company and will be financed by the um, the, uh, the commercial bank, uh, the industry and the commerce of the uh, 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 bank of China. And um, this project and the, uh, will uh, impact uh, this lake. This lake is uh, um, uh, reservoir and uh, Lake uh, Kariba. It's between the two countries, um, Zimbabwe and uh, Zambia, is a drink, the, uh, drinking water source for both sides. And uh, this power station require uh, the fresh water resource. And so the uh, contract, uh, uh, the Chinese company, Power China, is building the uh, 200 kilometers long the pipeline to bring the fresh water uh, to the uh, power station. So this uh, uh, power station, the coal power plant, uh, uh, not only has a, a climate impact and also have the impact on the water, res the water resource and they have an impact across a boundary. It's the transboundary impact uh, project. And all those, uh, this, uh, Three cases I'm, I'm listing here, just a small, tiny uh, part of the a big a BRI project. All the three uh, projects, there are Chinese banks involved and their state-owned Chinese company uh, involved in, they are either contractor, investors, and uh, they are owners of some uh, um, mines, so there are various ways for the Chinese company getting to this those uh, natural resource rich country, and uh, they those country um, they have a different level of rule of law and the governance, uh, the capacity of the uh, environment governance, and have different reaction to China's or international investment, and. Uh, how China can make it the promise to make those uh, uh, investment green. This is a big question. You can just uh, simply say it's in the host country's business. We do not interfere their uh, uh, decision making and let them deal with those issues. Uh, that is, you can, you can, if you just uh, leave this question to the host country, those promise uh, being a uh, green leader and make the Belt Road green cannot uh, come true. So that is my, uh, my points. And uh, so we need to uh, make the promise to action and what we can do. This is a question for all of us. So yeah, that's all. Thanks so much, Jingjing. You could unshare your screen and then we all will get big on the, uh, here on the webinar. Thanks so much. I appreciate the insights of the, the legal side and what's happening on the ground. Um, happily, there've been a lot of people who've been tweeting and emailing in, but just a quick reminder, if you want to continue asking questions, look at the bottom of the webpage that has the information on our Twitter and the email. Um, where to start? Because I did get a lot of questions. Um, I think, can I'm going to go back to the domestic question because um, Sam Deal from China Dialogue wanted to kind of go back to the beginning to, to look a little bit more deeply. I think it's by Efi and Judy here about what are the drivers of coercive domestic environmental policy making in China's, in China's central government? They want to, he's asking, is it driven, to what extent is driven by the green concerns and to what extent are these driven by other co-benefits and which do you think is most prominent? And then he says, and then he did a follow-up and he'd also like to hear more detail on the, those specific drivers beyond the environmental concerns. Did that make sense? Okay. Yeah, I, I can uh, sort of try to address that question. And Judy, uh, please add if I missed anything. Um, I think, you know, both the environmental uh, motivations and the non-environmental motivations are at play uh, in many of the cases that we've documented in the domestic setting. Uh, the environmental motivations are, are really um, significant. Uh, we're, we're talking about uh, a matter that basically is at the core of the Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy. Uh, as a ruling party for the People's Republic of China and, and seeing that the air, the water has been polluted uh, to such extent and seeing that soil contamination has been such uh, a, a significant issue, especially in recent years, which causes then relatedly uh, the food safety issue and all of that, the rising middle class in China is feeling and expressing 
an awful lot of discontent with all these issues. And so I think for the, for the, for the ruling um, party, um, that is an issue that they have to deal with and it's an issue that they want to deal with. Um, so the environmental uh, concerns are, are certainly one of the main driving forces, but also um, looking at the specific ways in which um, the Chinese state intervenes into the environment. They seems to be in this frame of mind of wanting to quote unquote, kill two birds with one stone. They wanna uh, achieve not only environmental goals, but also a lot of the social control goals and the pacification of the borderlands in the Western parts of the country, while at the same time accomplishing environmental um, uh, initiatives or, or engaging in environmental initiatives, whether it's through um, installing more surveillance cameras, even facial recognition cameras at the trash bin to monitor if citizens are sorting their garbage correctly according to government specifications, or in the western part of the country, establishing national parks, but at the same time using these national parks as an opportunity or even a prompt to urge urbanized nomadic groups to bring these people into urban settlements that are built by the government, thus fundamentally altering their ways of life. Um, so I think, you know, um, Sam asked a great question, uh, which factors are, are at play? I, I think that the precise um, uh, sort of ingenuity, if you will, of China's approach to uh, environmental authoritarianism is that it does accomplish a lot. Um, in actuality, uh, but I'll turn it over to Judy. Actually, I don't have anything to add to that. I think that was a fantastic question. I just want to say, hi, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the Sam Gill fan club is open for business. Um, well, <laughs> one thing just to add on that, if it kind of just, to, to, okay, so, but there's also, you know, China has made some decisions. I mean, the, the kind of the, the issue of illegal wildlife trade, right? So under the previous, under the Obama administration, there was a lot of kind of, I call it kind of cooperative competitive, comp, there's some interesting kind of competition about doing better on cracking down on Ill illegal wildlife trade. I gave an example of, I think one, one day, the Obama, you know, the administration ordered burning of like 60 tons of, of, of elephant ivory. You know, the, why, the word came out, I mean, they, they burnt 61 tons of the tusks. And then the next day, the Chinese burnt 61. You know, just a kind of one better, and and that we've seen the Chinese government sometimes starting to maybe walk back some of their rules that were going to be allowing, um, like raising of tigers or not raising the tigers. Do you have any? Do you, any of you have any comments about you know? Because in this space, it seems like China is responding to the international community, and even you know Chinese, you know Yao Ming and all these other people speaking up against you know uh, illegal wildlife trade. Yeah, we, we wrote about the wildlife trade as a kind of a mixed um, case where there are some really dramatic successes, um, particularly with respect to shark fin. Um, and thanks to Yao Ming and thanks to the fact that shark fin is pretty easy in a way to change the public um, fondness for it. Apparently it doesn't taste like anything and it was just a status symbol anyway. Um, Elephant ivory issue is um, harder. I think the appreciation for ivory is much more deeply entrenched in uh, Chinese culture. And um, the fact, this gets back to the Belt and Road, the fact of China's enormous presence in Africa has made that trade in elephant ivory all that much more active, much more porous, much more corrupt. Um, and there is you know, blame to be had on the African governance side and there's blame to be had on the Chinese side. So this ivory belongs to elephants campaign has not been overall quite as successful, but certainly you have to applaud the Chinese government for banning the trade in ivory, especially when you think in context, I forget how many years ago when China um, wanted to make a gift for the UN, the gift that they gave was this elaborately carved elephant tusk, you know, so this is really a big deal for Chinese culture and appreciation. Um, and then we have all of those poor little pangolins, you know, and the turtles and all of these sort of less charismatic species that are being trafficked by literally the ton um, into China and also, you know, Vietnam and other parts of um, Southeast Asia. So um, it's not easy. I think wildlife is hard um, in that um, it needs a lot of expertise from a lot of people. Um, and 
Um, yeah, so, but again, give credit where credit is due and to try to change that culture of eating everything on four legs that isn't a table, right? As they say about the people of Guangzhou um, and also the entrenched belief in the value of Chinese medicine and the fact of filial piety. And, you know, if this medicine is gonna beef up or cope tofu up grandma's immune system, you know, no, no, no cost should uh, be too high. So it's a hard one, but overall, I think it's um, somewhat of a, a mixed success story. Actually, kind of along that line, sorry if I'm kind of skipping around, I got a lot of questions and they're covering the whole gamut. Um, uh, Wu Changhua, um, at, she's at the CEO of Teconet, um, an old friend used to work at WRI when I first met her. Um, she, she, she asked a question, if there are three things China has contributed to global environmental protection and governance, what would they be? I feel like it's a game show question, but yeah. But, but it, so what would you say? I mean, so again, mixed bag with the wildlife. Um, I, I guess I can I can start with the first, and I guess we've got three speakers, so perhaps one uh, for each of us. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is the uh, waste import ban. Um, that is a very significant success. Now, a lot of people uh, sort of underestimate uh, the extent of care and thought that goes into that ban. A lot of people saw that as a ban that came into effect at the beginning of 2018. And that was the moment when uh, the, the, the restrictions almost amounted to a ban, but still that wasn't a ban. That was a, a list of prohibited materials, um, which essentially required a higher level of purity in the imported materials. But that wasn't a sudden abrupt ban that suddenly came into force. It was a regulation that went through multiple iterations within the span of almost more than a decade um, in which the Chinese state actually consulted with the domestic recycling industry and tried to figure out what was most meaningful for them and how they could introduce a ban or a restriction while at the same time improve um, recycling domestically. Now, also internationally, the impact of the ban has been, you know, nothing short of global. Um, we're seeing a lot of Asian countries following suit by suggesting that, well, if China is take, not taking other people's garbage, why should we? They're introducing very similar bans. Um, and as a result, it has now had the consequence of impacting how um, recyclers operate in California uh, or how uh, New Zealand practices um, recycling domestically and try to establish more incentives with, for people to reuse um, in, in, in the domestic setting. So I think that that is the first thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, I agree. I, I love that. It's like clean okay, up you your own pick another room. One. <laughs> clean up your own room. But I got two more really okay. quick one. One is I just saw that they banned those little soaps from those hotels, not soaps, those little shampoo bottles from those hotels. Great. Perfect. All right, so that's a little one, but it's still a big one. Like, why can't we all ban those little bottles? Um, but um, you have to give credit for this goal of um, carbon neutrality by 2060. Um, the devil will be in the implementation. My fear or my concern is that many of these tools that we outline in China Goes Green will be deployed um, and that it may also lead the country to have more excuses for building ill-advised big dams, um, particularly in seismic areas and in the upriver of the Mekong and the Brahmaputra and so on and so forth. But, you know, if, as long as we keep an eye on it and the implementation, you know, doesn't end up being incredibly painful for innocent people, uh, then overall setting that kind of goal is really great. And I also want to say hi, Changhua. <laughs> We're going to do more on that. I'm going to ask more about the carbon neutrality, but Jing Jing, do you have an example of a good, good impact globally or even domestically? Uh, yeah, uh, I could say uh, potentially has a global impact. The uh, transparency of the uh, information, environment, data, and information, and the public interest litigation. I think there's two. Um, I I. They have already have met uh, a big uh, difference within China, and I hope it can have uh, um, uh, 
broader uh, impact and uh, I hope that China can accept uh, the cases uh, from the BRI countries and uh, this uh, public interest, uh, environment public interest mitigation category uh, that will make China contribute to the global environment uh, governance. And I'm going to insert one of the, the obvious ones is that, you know, China, um, you know, how they became a huge producer of renewable energy, solar panels, for example, and not only, you know, so making it cheaper, helping it spread globally, but my, one of my favorite examples, and this is kind of, kind of curious how with your course, I mean, it does look like kind of like course of environmentalism when they did about a year ago when I called it on um, solar power Darwinism, where the government said, uh, let's see, tomorrow, no more subsidies for solar power. And suddenly, boom, half of them disappeared, these companies in China, but then the strong survived. And, you know, they're kind of trying this also with electric vehicles, but, you know, but it's not, but that electric vehicles, clearly, it doesn't look like it's really a true market. I think solar panels that did become more of a free market and made it stronger. And, you know, there's this very kind of, you know, the, the, the Xi Jinping said that, you know, we're going to have no more internal combustion engines, I think it was by 2035. And that's similar to the bag, you know, the plastic ban is that it has, it, it ripples throughout the world. And we are now seeing the push for electric vehicles around the world. So I, okay, I snuck in too. Um, but it is also kind of a mixed bag even within China because there's, a, we've had a meeting on this where, you know, people are being forced that the only car they can buy is an electric vehicle and it's not always the best kind, um, but yeah. So we'll, we'll <clears throat> move on. Let's see, we've got, um, well, maybe just linger a moment on the, the carbon neutrality pledge. Um, I have uh, Chuan Chi Xu from VOA News, who kind of asked about, you kind of hinted this about if it's really feasible for China to reach these goals and what might the major obstacles be? Um, and maybe a, just a quick comment on the politics surrounding the coal industry in China. Does anyone want to take that one? Yeah, um, well, quickly. Um, Domestically, I think we've pointed out that they could account everything that they want to account for domestically, but internationally, I, I don't think we should uh, underestimate the impact of Chinese uh, ecological footprint outside its borders. But even domestically, I think one of the things we wanted to pay attention to is how the Chinese state is going to account for carbon. What we're seeing in uh, the last couple of years when this carbon neutrality idea was uh, implemented on a smaller scale, let's say in the city of Beijing and in some of the major sporting events, what they've been trying to do is to do a full scale carbon inventory to calculate the amount of energy that's used to heat up or cool down the stadium, uh, the amount uh, of the, uh, the, the length of the distances driven uh, by the vehicles that ship people, that transport people to the stadiums and so on and so forth. And then once you, you get a total carbon amount for a given event, you compare that with the actual allocated carbon emission credit that the government has designated for said event. If it's over, then they have to buy it from the carbon cap and trade mechanism. Now, my immediate question is who gets to decide how these carbon credits are allocated? Every single piece of our daily lives, everything that we do has a carbon footprint. If we are subjecting everyone and every company to this carbon neutrality benchmark, if you will. Does it mean that everything that we do will have to be checked against a certain quota that's being allocated to us? And, and, and how do we know um, who's, who's doing the math behind the curtain, so to speak? Okay, I've got um, Steve Wolfson from the US EPA. He asked like five questions, so I'm not gonna give you all of these, Steve. Um, what, well, what, I'm gonna start with one with Jingjing. Jing. Um, he wants to know about, so we're focused domestic and then I'll give you some BRI ones, but wants to know about the implementation of the new type of public interest litigation cases brought by the Procuratoriate public prosecutors in China. I mean, I, th I think he's looking for, is there some, some interesting news and optimism about what the state prosecutors are doing in China? No, I'm not a big fan of the, the, the litigation brought by the prosecutor of the uh, uh, office. Um, I I think the public interest litigation uh, I should give the, the 
supposed uh, a space for civil society and the public, uh, the, the general public the citizens to uh, to hold the polluters uh, accountable. Um, for uh, prosecutor office, they have their very strong power. They do not need this mechanism. They they have their um, resource and tool. Um, but it, yeah, even though I am not uh, the big fan, I think in you know, overall it's a good thing. Uh, uh, for the, the, the yeah, bringing the prosecutors uh, to this uh, uh, arena, and they have filed much more uh, public interest litigation than uh, uh, NGOs, and uh, they have a uh, human resource and resources to do that. Um, I am not a very close follow the each kind uh, each of the cases the prosecutor the office have brought. Uh, um, and I hope and generally hope that leave some space for NGOs to bring the, the cases. That's an, that's an excellent point. And so I was kind of curious, is there, because we, we, you, you, we hear cases coming up of like Friends of Nature and others bringing public interest lawsuits. What are the, what are the trends that you're seeing? Are, are, are these, is it more difficult today for, for NGOs and citizens to bring these public interest lawsuits? In general, it's uh, always difficult, uh, not an easy uh, task uh, to do. And uh, I think that now it's getting more difficult for a nonprofit uh, to do because they are, most of them are short of funding and they have to compete in ways prosecutor office um, uh, over certain cases. And so it's always uh, difficult for an um, NGO you know, to file public interest litigation. And but yeah, there's still I think it's, it's still a very promising uh, uh, space, and this is why I said if we, China can contribute to the uh, global uh, environmental governance, that should be one, and could we really have a good uh, already have a good uh, experience, and uh, uh, if we can open that door to all. Uh, barreled partner country, the cases uh, um, caused by Chinese investment in those countries, that would be ideal. <laughs> and um, Steve also, I think he wants you to see if anyone has crystal balls. I'm just curious about <clears throat> the the current uh, stimulus spending right now. Are, they, are you seeing very much that it's very green? I mean, <laughs> I mean I, yeah, I can. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I can't go uh, give it a go. I suppose, you know, if you look at the actual um, spending rules and, and the suspension of environmental impact assessment and environmental regulations on um, certain companies that are considered strategically important for the revival of the Chinese economy, uh, that that is not good news to me. I mean, I, I, I can't remember the exact period in which these companies are completely exempted from any environmental audits um, during this period of, of um, economic uh, re revival. I mean, the, the spending of the money itself, I, th I think a lot of it is going into coal-fired power plants, but not all of it. Um, I think there, there's renewables in it as well, but I, I'm, a, I'm just a little more concerned with the suspension of, of environmental regulations. And, it's problematic in many ways, but one of the things that really worries me is that it seems to pit environmental protection against economic development. It, it, it's making the environmental bureaus to seem as though that they are the bad guys in pursuing economic um, bouncing back, if you will. Okay, and uh, Sam, since he's like our favorite questioner, and then, but uh, Sam has another one for Jing Jing about how might the COVID-19 and the slowing economy and the the rising inter international tensions impact the BRI spending? Are we seeing, you know, is, is, is there, have you been seeing kind of a slowdown in China's BRI spending right now? Do you think there's, is there, is there movement to kind of change things? Because I mean, you, you know, the COVID, the pandemic has changed everyone's calculus. Yeah. Yeah, I, ha I have been seeing the, the company slowing down their uh, work on the ground and uh, uh, early this year, but they are bouncing back and uh, they are moving much faster than uh, I expected. And like the, um, the cases I mentioned, the Samando uh, investment and uh, uh, the, the all happened this year. The, a company already got uh, signed agreement. The agreement has been approved by the uh, Guinean uh, Parliament, and now is the last stage. 
uh, at their constitutional court uh, to be uh, waiting for the approval. And they're moving very fast. I, I, I don't think uh, the pandemic uh, will stop uh, they're the um, Chinese companies investment because they have been invested huge amount of money and they they will try their best uh, to to make up and they also got uh, have got some uh, support from uh, government Ministry of Commerce and they signed a memo with uh, um, the the back um, the China Development Bank early the, in March uh, gave this uh, uh, emerging uh, loan to uh, those uh, uh, company has uh, have um, investment uh, brought uh, so the this government incentive for support of also help the those uh, Chinese company to continue. So it won't uh, the pandemic won't stop uh, the investment. That the overall trend of the investment. Okay, thanks for that. Um, got two two more questions. Uh, Ife, your 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 ecological data surveillance stuff is is perked a lot of interest. Uh, Wu Changhua, she um, she asked about how the the question about the ecological surveillance, particularly the satellite tech such as Case Earth, uh, with the UN. Um, she, she wants to know like what kind of mechanisms or rules should be in place to enhance the governance around this eco surveillance and also Margot de Groot van Embedden uh, from the Asia Center in EU. Um, she's kind of, she's, she's also, she was just asking more broadly about like China, how do you perceive the growing promotion of China made environmental data like Globe Land 30, Ocean Observation that you know how it's influencing the norms and negotiation negotiations with host countries so if you can do a quick one two punch on those and then we'll have a minute for everyone to do some closing comments it sounds good I, I think you know I, I I'm not envisioning any specific roles per se for any of these platforms but I think the most important thing really is transparency uh, where are these satellites uh, positioned and, and, and what's the coverage, what's the orbital coverage of these satellites and what kind of data are they gathering? What's the full extent of remote sensing data that these satellites are, are capable of generating? Can, can I insert there? Because China's not the only one doing this. Right. Right. So, so you're saying that in general, the, all countries. Okay. Yeah, so that's absolutely right. That. All that we no, don't know. No. Uh, yeah, there, there's there's a general lack of clarity about you know the, the kind of data that we see in whatever data uh, portals that they decide to publish. What's not published, and and what are the categories that are lumped together? Uh, what's what's the uh, you know actual frequency of data that that the satellite sends back to planet Earth? Um, and, and I think you know transparency itself would go a very long way. Um, the data itself can be used by so many scientists to produce good, robust environmental knowledge that can continue to benefit humanity. Um, but without a transparent data protocol, I just don't think um, that level of use can be counted on. Okay, it sounds like this needs to be a separate meeting. The Wilson Center also has kind of a, a, our science, technology and innovation program. I think I need to do a meeting together with them because it, this again, it's not just China that's gathering lots of data and questions of transparency. Um, so we got just a couple minutes here. I, I wanted to see if, um, go around if that like what, you know, look, so a lot of the questions here we're asking us, you guys to look forward, but what are, what are Judy, Ife, Jingjing, Jing, um, you know, maybe it's a little bit too broad, but in terms of like what, like in terms of like, like Jingjing, Jing, in terms of you kind of touch on this about the BRI next steps, but I'd like to, let's Judy, let's start with you kind of looking forward. Where do you think, where do you see things going for China? I mean, the world is, has changed a lot since you published your book. Uh, the world has changed a lot. Um, I mean, maybe this COVID thing is just a momentary flash. And as Jingjing Jing says, it's going to come roaring back, but I actually did want to also say something when we were talking about the wildlife trade, mm -hmm. that one of the reasons that the Chinese are interested in curbing that wildlife trade is that we have to um, see the connection between the wildlife trade and the emergence of this coronavirus. Um, I actually didn't plan a whole lot of like final comments. The com final comment I wanted to make is um, that writing this book with Ife has been nothing but a sheer pleasure and um, being able to talk about the book at the Wilson Center has been a sheer pleasure. And when I looked at the list of people who said they were coming, so many people I haven't been in contact with for a long time, so many old, old friends, that's a sheer pleasure. And so I wanted just to say in my closing that 
Um, I hope that if we can be of any use to any of you, you'll feel free to contact us. We're um, easy to find. I'm just Shapiro at America and Ife is, you know, a little more complicated, but you can find us easily. We're saying yes, you know, at this point. Um, being stuck at home with the coronavirus is actually not a bad time to have a book coming out. Um, so thank you all again. Yeah. Thanks. Ife? Uh, I, I want to. I agree with everything that Judy just said. Um, this this has been tremendously humbling to see um, how many different people are bringing their own perspectives uh, into this discussion when they uh, read this book, when they write emails to us and share with us their reactions and everything. It's just been great um, getting getting to know um, this field and getting to know many people in this field. Um, but in closing, in my closing, I, I just want to say that. Um, China seems very eager, the Chinese state seems very eager to fill the space of global environmental leadership now that the, U the US is very clearly um, retreating from that position. Um, and, and Judy and I both think that China has a significant, very, very significant role to play. And if China can do it well, it could mean so much for humanity at large. Um, but China can only do so well. You know, one of the main conclusions in the book is that it may seem counterintuitive, but state-led environmentalism only works when the state is not so strong, when state power is placed in firm checks by various groups within society, domestically or internationally. And we just believe honestly that this is the way to go. And if China can open itself, the Chinese state can open itself up for these various supervisions from the masses as, as Mao would have it. Um, it. It could play such a significant leadership role that everybody would want to see. That's great, thank you. So Jingjing, you got about 30 seconds to tell us your quick comment, yeah. sorry, but. Yeah, yeah uh, just followed uh, Yifei what Yifei said, I think the, um, what the comp contribution China can uh, make is net non-state uh, players to play a role in China's uh, global uh, environment governance, net uh, non-profit organizations from uh, China and from BRI countries participating in the uh, uh, conversation with, uh, with state and uh, net community uh, express their concerns and uh, listen to them. That is what China needed to to make those uh, promise uh, being green and clean leader in the world. Yeah, that's my final remark. You guys have been great today. Loved having this conversation. I want to thank the audience for tuning in. Um, stay tuned. You're going to be seeing some meetings coming up. We're doing we're doing a, we're di we're dumpster diving into plastic in the next six seven months now. We're doing a lot on that. Also, um, we will be having a meeting that's going to look deeply into carbon neutrality and how green is the recovery in the US and China. So thank you so much again. I want to thank our AV staff for making this all happen. And everyone, have a really wonderful Friday. Thank Signing you. off. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. Thank Thanks. you.